Let's begin by looking at how to declare variables in JavaScript. To declare a variable in JavaScript, we specify its name and assign it a value, in this case, the string Daniel. We can print a variable using console log. So we'll type console.log followed by the variable name. Notice that we didn't include any semicolons here at the end of our two statements. Semicolons are optional in JavaScript. Now let's go ahead and run this program. We can run it by typing node followed by the program name, intro.js. Here we see that Daniel is printed to the terminal. Here we'll use the const keyword to specify that the variable name is a constant and isn't expected to change throughout the program. So if we run this by typing node.intro.js, we'll get our printout for Daniel. There are two other keywords that you'll see. The first keyword is the var keyword, and this specifies a variable that's global in scope. The second keyword is the let keyword, and this specifies a variable that's local in scope. Also, remember that semicolons are optional in JavaScript, so if we run this, we don't get any errors. Great. Now that we've talked about variables in JavaScript, let's move on and talk about loops in JavaScript. Great. Now let's talk about for loops in JavaScript. So let's write a simple example loop. So here we have the for keyword. Then our initial condition, i equals 0, as long as i is less than 5, will increment i. So this is very similar to other languages. And let's play with this idea of the var and let keyword here. So we'll have a var keyword count, and then we'll set it to i, and then we'll console log that var keyword outside of the loop. And so remember, the var keyword is global in scope, so it's going to be preserved. The variable is going to be preserved even after the loop is complete. So that count variable will be available outside of the loop. And that's just because we're using the var keyword. So let's pop down to the terminal now and uh, run this. So here you see that that count is four because we were able to preserve it outside of the loop because we used the var keyword. So if we change that keyword to let, it's only going to be available within the scope of the loop. So if we go ahead and try and print count here, we'll get not defined. And that's because the count variable is not available outside of the scope. And that's because we use the let keyword here. So now that we're kind of comfortable with uh, loops in JavaScript, let's go ahead and look at an example of types. So JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. And we have several types. And one of the easiest ways to check the type of a variable is to use the type of keyword. So let's look at an example of using the type of keyword here. So there are several types. Well, one of them is the number type. And so if we do type of and then a number, like 5, and we'll console log the result of this type of uh, call, function call, we should get number. So let's go ahead and clear the terminal and then uh, run our program. And so we get a number. So a number is one of the types in JavaScript. We also have a string type. And so if we replace this with a string test and we run this, we'll get a string as our type. So we also have the Boolean type. And so we could type in true here. And these are default lowercase in JavaScript. So it's important to be careful there. And so here, true is a Boolean type. And we also have the null type in JavaScript. So null is a type 
And for historic reasons, the null type, when you do a type object on it, will return object. So let's go ahead and run this and see. And so the object return type here is for historic reasons with JavaScript. And so the final two types are the undefined type. And these, this is for variables that have not been uh, initialized. And then the object type. So every other uh, variable that we haven't discussed before is a type object. Now let's talk about some syntax that you haven't might not have seen before. Uh, triple equals. And this is different from double equals. So triple equals is going to do a slightly different type of comparison to double equals in JavaScript. So let's go ahead and console log 5 double equals the string 5. And so what do you expect to happen here? So JavaScript, if we run this, is going to print out true. So let's go ahead and run this. So why does it print out true? JavaScript does something called type coercion. Type coercion is very similar to casting. So it's going to coerce one of the types so that the types match. More specifically, JavaScript will try to transform the type on the left side of the operator so that it matches the type on the right side of the operator. So in this case, the number 5 gets transformed into the string 5. This is different from the triple equals operator, which does not do type coercion. So variables are compared directly. So if we go ahead and run this program, we'll get false. It's important to be very careful when working with type coercion in JavaScript. For example, some strings get converted to zero or get co coerced to zero. For example, the new line, new line character string forward slash n forward slash n actually gets coerced to zero. So if we run this, we'll get true. Let's look at a slightly more involved example. So let's create a couple variables. And this example will illustrate two types of coercion implicit coercion and explicit coercion. With implicit coercion, the JavaScript engine is going to do the coercing for, coercing for us. With explicit coercion, we're going to do the coercion explicitly. So here we'll create two variables, x equals 3, the number, and y equals 3, the string. Now if we do x plus y here, the x, which is on the left-hand side of the operator, is going to get coerced to a string, 3. And so our result is going to be 33. However, if you're a programmer and looking at this really quickly, you might not see that. And so let's go ahead and run this. So here we get 33 as our result. Instead, we want to implicitly tell the reader that this is being changed. So we could wrap this in a string function. So we'll say string x. This explicitly says that x is being converted to a string and then add it to y. And here, y will be treated as a string because that's its original type. So 33 is our result. Now, in the next module, we'll talk about functions. So Let's clean up here and switch over to the next video. Great. Welcome to another lecture. In this lecture, we'll talk about functions in JavaScript. One of my favorite quotes is by Douglas Crawford, where he says, the best thing about JavaScript is its implementation of functions. So let's switch over to the live coding environment, where we'll start implementing functions in JavaScript, and you can get a better feel for how you can write your own functions in JavaScript. Let's get started. Here we'll create a function called grow. And our function will take two parameters. 
the number, and then the percentage that we want to increase by. So let's start off by typing the function keyword. So the function keyword tells JavaScript that we're creating a function. Then let's apply the parameters. So we'll start last, that's the number, and then increase the percentage that we want to increase the number by. And then we'll use curly braces to indicate the beginning and end of the function. And here we'll just return last multiplied by one plus or increase, which is a percentage expressed as a decimal. JavaScript supports named and anonymous functions. Here, this is an example of a name function. Notice it has a name following the function keyword. Also has two parameters, last and increased, and also uses the return keyword to specify what's returned from the function. Let's go ahead and call this function. So let's call grow. And then two parameters. So here we're calling the function grow on 0.7 and increasing it by 10%. So our result should be 0 0.77. So let's go ahead, clear the console, and run our program. Great, we get 0 0.77 as expected. Okay, let's look at another uh, function example. So in JavaScript, functions are first class objects. So we can use them like we would use objects or other variables. So let's go ahead and assign this function to a variable called career. Now we can call the grow function by referencing the career variable. So we can replace grow with career. And if we go ahead and run this by typing node.intro.js, we get 77 as before. So here we've indirectly called the grow function through the career variable. And this is because functions are first class objects. So this means that we don't actually have to use the grow uh, name. We can remove that here. And when we do that, we've created an anonymous function in JavaScript. So here, this function is an anonymous function because it doesn't have a name. And we've assigned that anonymous function to a variable called career. So let's go ahead and run this function. So like before, we'll type node.intro.js to run our program, and we get 77. So semicolons are optional in JavaScript. So sometimes you'll see a semicolon included at the end of a function. And since this is an assignment statement, this is how programmers kind of emphasize that this is a complete statement. Great. So next time, we'll look at arrow functions which is a unique thing to JavaScript. Welcome back to another lecture. In this so lecture, we'll talk about a special function function. syntax called arrow functions that JavaScript supports. Has brackets, arrow functions brackets, begin with a bracket, and brackets, end with a bracket, and enclose all, and enclose of, the all of the parameters within it. And then there's, then there's arrow a special that arrow to the that's assigned to an expression. This is the body of the function. And then because it's a first class object, it and can then we be can assign this arrow function to a in variable, this case, in this case variable, the variable func. So here's an example. So below we'll see in the function expression form. that we looked at in the last lecture. So here's our function. Here it has the function keyword, then some parameters, all of our arguments, and, our and then a return for and the expression. The this is equivalent to equivalence. the arrow function. Notice there's no above. return statement here. Here, notice there's the no return statement. Only comprise of one line. The arrow function will just return JavaScript the result of whatever, whatever expression is on that is. line. Whatever expression here is on that line. Now let's switch over to the live coding so environment fine. and look at some let's examples. Let's create an arrow function that multiplies two numbers. So we'll start with our brackets and then our two parameters. We'll call them A and B. And then we'll do our arrow function, which is just an equal followed by the greater than sign. And do A times B. And then great, there we have our arrow function. So we can assign it to some variable. And so we'll do our equal operator. And then we can call this variable multiply. But before we do that, let's specify the let keyword. And so now we have 
a full arrow function. It's optional. And remember the that the let keyword is optional, like and so if you remove it, uh, all variables it are just assigned the let keyword by JavaScript default, default with to the let JavaScript. So now let's go ahead and look at an example of writing so the multiply function, function with our previous syntax. So we'll have our multiply variable, and then we'll assign it to function. This time it's an anonymous function, and we'll take in two parameters, a and b, and then we'll return a times b. So the arrow function above is equivalent to this function here. Notice and remember, semicolons are optional. Here. So notice that because we don't have a return statement, and that's because line, if we have a single line arrow function, no the result of the expression no is what is returned. So let's go ahead okay. and write some So now let's look at an example of calling the arrow function. So we'll do console log and then multiply. And let's name the second function multiply two. So we'll call multiply, and we'll supply two parameters, in this case, 2 and 4. So let's go ahead and run this. So we'll do node and the name of our file, intro.js. And we get 8, as expected. OK, let's write another arrow function. So this arrow function that we'll write will take a parameter and compute its square. And to be more efficient, we'll just use the multiply function that we wrote earlier. So let's go ahead and make some space. And then we'll put our opening brackets followed by a parameter. In this case, we'll call that parameter A. And one of the great things with arrow functions is if you only have a single parameter, you don't need the brackets. So then we can have our arrow They're function, functional. and then we can call multiply we could call our on a, on comma, a. Our parameter a. So this would be and our arrow function a. that computes the square. And then now we can we go ahead and we can assign it to variable some variable square. square. So now let's call our call square function. Variable. So we'll call square. And then we'll pass in our single parameter by saying square, uh, a, and, and we'll select a value here for a. So we'll say case, four. four. And now let's go ahead and run this program. This should print out. So we'll clear the or... console, and then run our file node intro.js. And so here we get sixteen. Great, as expected. Sixteen. So far, we've looked at arrow functions that use well, a single line. So let's go ahead and clear the screen and look at another example of an arrow function that uses multiple lines. If arrow function has multiple lines, so this we'll arrow function that we'll write will take in two numbers and then an example of this. return so the number a that's bigger. That takes in two numbers so let's go ahead and use our uh, arrow function syntax. We'll take in two so parameters. We'll take in two numbers a and, and here we'll use curly braces to denote that our arrow function arrow is going to be more than line. one line. So we need to include these brackets here. So then we'll check and we'll and see we'll if, a if a is greater than is or, greater equal, than to or b, equal to b, then we'll return a. Now we'll return Otherwise, a. we will return Otherwise, b. We'll return Notice that because our arrow function b. is multiple lines, we've included a return statement and, and curly braces. And then let's go ahead and assign this to example, a variable bigger. bigger. Great. So now let's go ahead and run so this uh, code to see if we have any errors. So. We'll do node intro.js. Great, uh, no oh, errors. So now let's go ahead function. and call the bigger function. So we'll do console, console log, log bigger. bigger, and we'll pass and in we'll two pass parameters. In two two, here we'll pick two numbers, and six. say two and six. So we expect to get six out here. So now let's run this, and if our function's working as expected, it should return six. Great, function works. Great. we get Six returned so, as expected. Let's see if we could write a shorter Great. version. Now there's a challenge. Pause the video the and see if you can write a shorter, shorter version, version of the bigger, bigger function. Ideally, we want to get down all right. the way to Think a single line. Use the ternary operator. As a hint, you could do this if you use the, the ternary video. operator. So go ahead and pause the video. Great. Let's all right. Let's start looking at some solutions.
So here we'll have two parameters, a and b, we'll take two followed by our a arrow function. Like before. And then we could return. And then we'll have our return line where we'll check a is, is a greater than, than or equal to b. And then we'll use our turning operator. operator. This is true. And if now a we'll is greater than or equal to b, a, then we'll, we'll return, return a, otherwise we'll return b. Then we could see. And then we can assign this to our bigger variable. So if you go ahead and run this, we'll get six like we did Great. before. Works as instructed. But we can still we'll make this shorter, this. right? Here we have a single return, and so we can compress this way? down to a single line. Yes, we can. So pause the video and see if you can do this. Since this our so here we'll remove our line, curly braces. We the brackets or the return statement. I will remove our return statement because we're just doing a single line, so we don't need it. And now we have our one line version of our bigger function. We can simply do this. So let's go ahead and run this to make sure that we don't have any errors. So we'll go down and we'll type node so intro.js. We'll get six. And we get Great. six as expected. So I hope you enjoyed this section on JavaScript functions. In the next section, we'll start discussing JavaScript objects and JavaScript's inheritance model. Welcome to our second lecture. In this lecture, we'll talk about JavaScript objects. JavaScript objects are containers for properties. And these properties are name value pairs. So each property will have both a name and an associated value. Values can be any JavaScript type except undefined. This means that values can even be other JavaScript objects. Now that we have a general idea of what JavaScript objects are, Let's switch over to the live coding session and write some code that demonstrates these ideas. So we'll begin by creating an empty JavaScript object. We'll use curly braces to signify the beginning and end of the object. An opening curly brace represents the beginning of the object, and a closed curly brace represents the end of the object. Notice this object doesn't contain any name or value pairs. We can also create a student object. And we'll include a couple of properties in this student object. First name. So the name is first name. And the value is Daniel. Notice that the property name is a string. We can also add a property that doesn't use a string. In particular, here, the property name title is not a string, but the value PhD is a string. Properties in an object are separated by a comma. Let's add a third property, last name. Here, the name is last name, and it's a string. And the value is Graham, and it's separated by a comma. It's important to note that the last comma is optional for objects. So the last property doesn't need a comma at the end. Objects can also contain other objects. So let's create an object that will contain the student object. Let's call it teacher. And let's add some properties. We'll have a name property, Daniel Graham, comma separated. Then we'll have a student property. This student property will be another object. So we have our opening and closing curly braces. It contains a property age, comma separated, another property name, in this case, John Stewart, the famous comedian, and finally, a grade, in this case, a number, 86.2. Remember that trailing comma is optional. We included it in the first object, but not in the second. Congratulations, you've written your first object in JavaScript. Take a second to look at it. Does it look familiar? Do you think you've seen it somewhere before? If you said JSON, you're right. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And it's the way that JavaScript represents objects.
Now let's access some of the properties of the objects we've just created. And in particular, we'll log these properties to the console. So they'll show up in our terminal below. So we'll start by typing console.log, and then we'll look at the student object. And here we'll access the first name property. Because the name is a string, we'll need to use the hard bracket syntax to access the property. So we'll type opening hard bracket, followed by the string representing the name, close hard bracket. Then we'll run our code using the node command, node object.js. And notice it's printed out the first name Daniel, which is the property of the student object. We can also access properties using the dot syntax. So here we'll access the title property using the dot syntax. So we'll do student.title, and then we'll run our program again, node.objects, and here we get PhD as the value. Now let's access some of the properties associated with the teacher object. So we'll copy our console log code down to the bottom here. And in particular, we're going to do a nested property. So we'll access that object that's associated with the student property. So we'll do teacher.student, that gets us to the student property, dot name, that gets us to the nested property inside of the student object. Let's go ahead and run this. And we get John Stewart, which is the name of the student nested in the teacher object. Take a second to look at this example. Now let's go ahead and access a property that's not associated with the object, in this case, salary. Here, we're gonna get undefined because this property is not associated with that object. So the salary property is not contained in the teacher object, and so we get undefined. Let's look at another example. In this example, we'll access a property within the salary property. So teacher.salary would be undefined. And so if we access teacher.salary.raise, here we're going to get an error because raise is not a property of the type undefined. So we can't read the property raise from the type undefined. Now that you have some practice reading properties, let's look at an example of setting a property. Here we'll set the name property. Here we use the bracket syntax and access the name property and then the equal sign to assign a value to that property. And here we're assigning Daniel G. Graham as the new value to the name property. We can also use double quotes or single quotes interchangeably in JavaScript. So let's just illustrate that here. Notice that we've used the bracket syntax to access the name property. Now let's go ahead and console log the teacher.name property. I've used both the bracket and dot syntax here to show that they can be used interchangeably. Now let's run our program. And if our program is working correctly, we should see Daniel G. Graham, PhD, as the new value. And there we have it. Daniel G. Graham is our new property value. So now let's go ahead and set a property that wasn't already defined in the object. In this case, we'll set a new property whose name is propose. And so we'll assign it some value. And here, the value that we'll choose to assign it is thinking and creating. So what this will do is it will create a new property associated with the object. So let's go ahead and use the dot syntax to do the same. So teacher.affiliation and UVA. And then we'll look at the teacher.propose property using the dot syntax. And we'll also do another console log for the teacher.affiliation property, and we'll use the dot syntax here as well. Notice that we get this great autocomplete with Visual Studio. So if this is working correctly, 
we should see Thinking and Creating and UVA printed out. Great, we get those values printed out as expected. Once more, I'd just like to highlight that the bracket notation and the dot notation can be used interchangeably because they're equivalent. OK, now let's look at an example of accessing properties in a nested object and also setting those properties. So we could always create a property by simply adding it to the initial declaration of the object. So here we've added a property rank for the student and a value of four. So now let's go ahead and set that property. So teacher.student.rank, and now we can assign it a value of one. Let's go ahead now and console log this property. And here we should see the value of four be updated to the value of one. So let's go ahead and run this. Great. Our rank is set to one. So let's clean up our IDE here and get ready for the next lecture. So in the next lecture, we're going to talk about inheritance in JavaScript. OK, uh, welcome back to another lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about um, web APIs and uh, web requests. And we'll give a, an overview of these. And um, we'll look at uh, how we can get data to and from our uh, apps. And so uh, let's switch over to uh, slides and uh, start digging in. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. And it's the way a client, like a mobile app, web app, or a terminal application like curl, will com communicate with a web server. And uh, that web server will be running a web API. And so these web APIs are typically implemented um, using frameworks, model view controller frameworks like Django or ASP.NET. Uh, but they're also serverless implementations, like the one that Amazon uses and Amazon AWS uses. Uh, we'll look at Google's serverless implementation in the form of cloud functions. And we'll cover these topics in more detail later on in the lecture. But this lecture is intended to give you kind of an overview for how this communication mechanism happens. So here's the client server breakdown from before. And what the client will do is it will connect to the server and it will issue a request. And there are two forms of these requests. There's a get request and a post request. In this uh, class, we'll be mostly focusing on post requests, but I want to measure, mention what a guest get request is. So in a get request, information is placed in the URL. That's all you have to kind of know about it for now. And then uh, the server will generate some response. And this response could contain your data in the form of JSON. So let's make this clear by looking at some uh, examples of web APIs. So this is the uh, Java doc for this web API um, that gives you cat facts. So if we click on this, we'll see the web API here. So the API is going to generate a response, and this response is going to be a JSON object. And that JSON object is going to have two properties. One is called fact, and that will have whatever the cat fact is. And then the other property is the length of the fact. And it also has the status code. We'll talk a little bit more about what these status codes mean. But uh, just know that 200 means that everything went well with the web request. We can also uh, access the endpoint and get a fact. So if we do catfact.ninja forward slash fact, we will get a fact. And so here's one of these cat facts. So Cats must have fat in their diet because they don't produce it on, on their own. And that's 76. And if we refresh this, we'll get another cat fact. Say the relative, uh, relative to its body size, the clouded leopard has the biggest canines of all animals. Uh, its dagger-like teeth um, can be as long as 1.8 uh, 
uh, inches. So great. That's another cat fact. So let's switch back to the slides. I just wanted to point out uh, this list here. So this list is a list of open source public APIs, um, some of which you might find uh, useful for your projects. So let's do a deeper dive into this um, CAFACT API. And in particular, let's look at the response and request. So curl is a command um, that you can perform on a Linux machine or a Mac. And it does a web request out to the URL that you give it. So here, if we did curl on CAFACT, the CAFACT AI endpoint, we would get the following response. So just a couple things to kind of highlight here that you um, would want to pay attention to in your responses. So this code here, this 200 code, means that everything's okay, that the, the request was processed correctly. And you also want to see the time and date um, for the machine. This might also be important for some of the requests. The actual data, the actual cat fact, will be included here. So this is where the data will be in the request. But a lot of libraries will go ahead and parse this for you, and the data will be easily available to you. So you don't have to worry about the syntax here. Just know about these condition um, response codes and time. Those are two kind of key elements. And the request is normally a get request. Um, this is just kind of an example, an example uh, request. Um, you don't have to worry about this, but the request also has headers. And I just wanted to point this out just in case you get into a situation where you're going to be debugging and you need to look at the headers um, to make sure that your request is formed correctly. And to stress this, this is just an example request. This is not the actual request that went out from this. So now uh, let's um, switch over to some live coding and talk a little bit about uh, asynchronous functions. So just a reminder, if you're going to follow along uh, with this, remember to install the um, request uh, MPI module that allows you to do requests. OK, uh, so we're going to switch over to our live coding session now. OK, um, let's go ahead and install uh, requests. 2.x.x, this will get us the most recent version. Great, we got a successful installation with zero vulnerabilities, which is good. Um, so let's go ahead and include that request library. And the way that we do that is we use this required keyword. So we'll talk a little bit more about importing and exporting uh, later, but this Require where it lets us use the request npm library. We're going to store that in a constant called request. Okay, now we're going to have some var app. And remember the point what we're writing here is an application that will go out to the catfax API and get us a cat fact. And we'll our app. We'll have some URL, um, catfact dot ninja forward slash forward slash fact. Um, and then we'll maybe we'll also store the cat fact across the part of this object as well. So cat fact, and we'll start it off as blank. Okay. So let's go ahead and make a request. So the way we make a request is by saying request. And then we pass in a URL. So we'll do app.url. And then we pass a callback. So a callback is a function that is called when the request is ready. And this request function will pass that function information to then process. So let's call our function that our callback handle request. So once our request is ready, this handle request function will be called. So let's implement that handle request. So request is going to pass this handle request function two parameters. 
error if there is an error, and then the response if it's able to successfully get the response. And we'll make this an arrow function just for readability. So if there's an error, right, we will want to just console log that error. If not, there's no error, then we're going to go ahead and uh, set app.catfact to the response.body. So remember, responses had headers and body, right? And the body was where the data was stored. And so we want to go ahead and take the body part of the response. So here, now if we go to the bottom here, and we console log print cat fact plus app dot cat fact, we're actually gonna not get anything printed out. So you think what would happen is that this request would fire, then it would go up to this handle function, handle request, and then when it has the response, it will pass in the response. And then that response, if there's no error, will then get updated to the object app.catfact. And then we would progress here and then print out catfact. But that's not what happens. What happens is that this request is processed asynchronously. So it will execute line 16, and that will execute in the background, and then it will go to line 17. And since catfact is empty, it will print for print catfact, we will get nothing. So. Let's go ahead and clear this and uh, clean clean this up a bit. So I'll save it and we'll run this. So promises.js and it said print cat fact, but we got nothing. So the question is, well, how do we fix this, right? Um, what do we do? Well, uh, we could go ahead and print the cat fact out in here, right? So. We could go ahead and um, print for um, cat fact. So we're just going to go console console dot log for uh, app dot cat fact. So now we'll print something out here that says. Um, in handler print um, catfact. So if we go ahead and run this, node promises will first print out the print catfact, and then we'll print out in handler, and then our JSON uh, for the catfact. So let's go ahead and clean up this JSON a bit. So let's do uh, json.parse. So we'll just create a nice clean object instead of a string. That body, and we'll just extract the fact and not the length. So we're going to ignore this length field. We're just going to extract the fact from that parse body. And then we'll go ahead and we'll print out that new object. So now we should just get the JSON object. Uh, without the length. So I'll clear this and then we'll do node promises.js and there we go. So in handler print cat fact. But notice it printed this cat fact first and then once the request was ready then it printed the second cat fact. So you know that's that's okay. So we just have to include our prints and updates in or um, handler functions. But uh, this might not always be the case. So let's switch back over to the slides and consider a more uh, involved example. Okay, uh, let's take a look at a more complicated example. So we looked at a kind of simple API request where it's possible to kind of nest uh, what we're interested in inside of the handler, but that's not always good practice. 
So here's an example of a um, login workflow. So here's there's some user and they also provide their credentials, which is just a fancy way of seeing their username and password uh, to some client. And then that client, either a mobile application, a web application, a tablet application, will go ahead and pass those credentials, normally via a post request, to some authorization server. And then that authorization server will return uh, an access token or um, uh, and a refresh token. We'll talk a little bit about what a refresh token is when we look at OAuth. But the uh, client will then pass that access token to some resource folder, say it wants to get email or something else, and then that resource folder will um, return the resource and a new access token. And it's not a new access token isn't always uh, returned, but uh, sometimes a new access token will be returned. So the idea is that you can create a really secure um, auth server with a bunch of things on logging and checking for credentials, and then your uh, resource servers will just need to have these access tokens. But both of the services um, have access to the same backend uh, database. We'll talk a little bit more about this architecture um, a little later, but what we want to be able to do is, could we think about how to implement these request structures here um, as we've seen previously? So we had a simple example where we could kind of get the token, but how do we then use the token? So here's our login example with curl. And here I'm passing in the JSON with the credentials. And so in this case, the credentials are Peter and their password, uh, city slicker. And I'm using this uh, API endpoint here called request. And uh, this is kind of a, an open um, API that lets you kind of test authentication. Um, so if you're interested in um, testing your mobile apps with any kind of auth service, this is a really um, good site to look at. So let's uh, switch over to our live coding session and uh, look at an example of using this request API. Uh, but before we do that, actually, I'll show you what this uh, request API looks like. It has a collection of things. Um, one of the endpoints that it provides is this uh, post login successful endpoint. So if you click on this, it will show you what JavaScript the API is expecting, or which JSON object, I'm sorry, the API is expecting, and what it will return. And so here, this will return. Uh, this is expecting uh, email and password, and if the email and password match this, then it will return a token and produce a 420 um, code. So this is just an example of uh, the request API. There are other APIs like um, login unsuccessful, which will, if you're missing a password, it will return missing password and a 400 error code. Okay, so let's uh, switch back over and um, write some JavaScript to access this API and uh, read the JSON values that we get back. Okay, so one way of um, getting an external library in uh, JavaScript is you can use this require syntax. So I can say require um, request. And then we're going to go ahead and store that in or just request variable. So we can access that class. And we'll make this a constant. And then we'll create our app namespace. And then we'll add something like the URL, HTTPS. Login, and then a token, and this token will start it off with something that's empty. And then one of the things that we could do is, along with this request, is we can pass it some options. So, say okay, request, and we're going to pass you some options. We'll build this up, and then we're going to need a function to handle our request. So, handle 
and all the rest. So what are these options that we can pass? Well, options is an object. Uh, that's what the request uh, library requires. And this object will contain things like the URL or URI. So app.url, we use that. And the type of request um, that we're going to get. So post, uh, posts, there are two types of requests, post and get. Um, post requests, post the content inside of the packet, and so that's what we're going to use here. And then the JSON value that we want. So we'll use the same post um, content uh, from the form, and I'll clear the screen here. Um, so here we're going to post email and password, and this is what the endpoint expects. And then we're going to go ahead and write our handler. So I'm going to go and have something that's going to handle the request. So handle request. And this is going to have some error and some response. And it will be an error function. And I will say if error, if we get an error, we're going to return console. Uh, log. We're just going to return from the function and we're going to console log the error. Um, otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get the app token and we're going to press the risk at the response body, which is going to just be a JSON here. And we're going to get the body of it and just the token. And then we're going to go ahead and console.log in handler the token plus the api app token okay and so now this request will go ahead and fire and i will make this smaller so we can see all the options here and so uh, towards the end right doesn't make any sense to do a print token because we're not going to get anything here. So I'll run this. So first I'll save it. And I'll do node. I'll do node promises.js. And there we go. Uh, in handler and we got our token. I should have included a space. So now we have a choice. So we need to take this token to then authenticate with uh, other services or get some resources. So we have a choice. We can't put a handle request object here, right? Because we won't have the token at that time. Instead, we could kind of nest the handler request in here. So uh, if we wanted to do this, we could do another handle request, right? And I just want to preface this by saying this is kind of bad practice, right? We don't want to end up nesting all of these requests. We want to have a better strategy. So we could have another handle request here. And we create another handler, maybe handle request two. And then it would take in some error and some response as the error function here. And if it had an error, we would return and console log that error. Um, and then we would go ahead and inside of this, we would then fire or request. And then with you know our additional options, if we decided to write them, and then our second handler. So, and then if we needed to do another request using information from that request, we'd have to create you know another request in here. And so this is not very good um, coding practice. This is kind of a bad idea. So, Let's switch over to this notion of something called promises. Great. So uh, let's now talk about a way of solving this problem of nesting handlers inside of other handlers. So JavaScript solves this problem by introducing promises. So promises are special objects. And these objects have some properties about them that make them really uh, useful for doing asynchronous programming. 
So for every new promise that we have, a function pointer is passed into that promise. And so if we look at this example, here we have a promise, the new promise being declared, and it takes its parameter is a function. And this function um, needs to have two uh, parameters associated with it. The first uh, parameter needs to be called when the function, the asynchronous function, successfully completes. And the second parameter needs to be called when this asynchronous function uh, fails. So you can think of the promise as kind of a wrapper for these functions. Great. In particular, when the resolve or reject uh, methods are called, they set some internal state properties associated uh, with the promise. So the uh, promise's state initially starts off as pending, and when either the reject and then changes to fulfilled or rejected, depending on the results of the resolve or reject call. And the result contains a value that was actually passed as a parameter to these re resolve or reject functions. So this might uh, seem a little strange, but let's go ahead and look at an example. So here's my new promise, and then this executor fun function here is the function that's going to execute asynchronously. So when that function completes, it would call the resolve uh, function, and that would change the state of the promise to fulfilled, and the value uh, of that was passed to this resolve function would then get updated into the result property of that promise. And if a promise, uh, if the executor, the asynchronous executor, failed in its asynchronous task, then it would fire the reject function, and that would set the state, the internal property of the promise, to be rejected and the result to be an error. And that error value would, be, would correspond to the error value that was called, called by the reject function. So let's switch back over to the live coding environment and uh, start looking at some examples of these promises. Great, uh, so let's switch over and do some live coding. So before we noticed that these network uh, requests take some time. So because these take some time, uh, we wanna figure out strategies for making sure our program doesn't block. And one of these ways is to have these callbacks using handlers. So instead of doing network requests, uh, using network requests to mimic uh, long uh, operations that take a long time, we'll just use a timer. So I'll just have this set timeout value here, and I'll pass in, I'll just do a console log. So it's an arrow function, does a console log, and I'll just say done. And set timeout just fires after a particular time. So in this case, a thousand seconds. Oh, a thousand milliseconds, which is one second. So I'll make this something larger so we can see it. So I'll make it five seconds. So if I go ahead and run this, no promises, it'll take five seconds before it prints out done. So hopefully soon. There we go. So uh, since we're using this as our asynchronous operation, our operation is going to take a long time over the network. Let's go ahead and uh, wrap it in a promise. So we'll say, this is a new promise. Here's our operation, it's gonna take a long time. So I have some function. Uh, it takes in two parameters, resolve and reject. And these two parameters are based on, are defined by the JavaScript engine. So the asynchronous function must take these two parameters in as, as, uh, as arguments. And then we'll close this up here. And so once the program completes, it can set call resolve. And when it calls resolve, this will change the state property that's associated with the promise to fulfilled. And it will change the 
result property to be done. So that's what resolve is going to do. And if we said reject, in the case of an error, this is going to set the fulfilled property to reject it and the result to be done. And here in a reject case, we normally want to make this an error. So the result would be error. So uh, now that we've had this kind of wrapper for a promise, um, let's go ahead and consume it. So promises are consumed by consumers. And so let's assign this promise to a variable, maybe promise. And then we'll just say that promise to be explicit. And then once the promise, once reject or accept is called, then the then function will fire inside of the promise. And the then function takes two parameters. The first parameter, so I'll just say function here, result. The first parameter is a function pointer, and this function pointer gets fired when there's a successful uh, thing from the promise. In other words, this first function gets fired when the resolve is called. And then we can have another function, error. And the second parameter is the one that's fired when the reject is called. So we could go ahead and we could say resolve here. And resolve would say, great, we got something. And then once that promise is complete, once this resolve is fired after the timeout, then we can go ahead here and we could console.log in consumer and then the result. So I can go ahead here and I will run this for you. And after five seconds, we should uh, get a printout. Great. So in consumer, uh, great, that was misspelled. <laughs> we got something. So what happened here was the resolve was fired. That changed the internal state. After the internal state was uh, updated, the promise then method is executed. And the result here is the value of the result internal property, which was set to great, we got something. So pause the video um, and uh, think about this. And so we could make this a lot simpler by using arrow functions. Okay, we can have a one line arrow function. What does this? So this is still valid. And then I'll just rerun this and I'll make this a little shorter so we get the answer more quickly. And another way that you uh, might see this written is the second parameter might be omitted, the reject case. And instead of uh, a parameter for the reject case, there will be a dot catch on the promise. And this dot catch gets fired if there's an error. So here we'll do error, and then I'll just console log. in consumer space plus my error. So if instead of calling the resolve here, we called a reject and I passed in something like, here is an error, the then on the, on the promise would fire and um, we would get in consumer, here is an error. I'll just clear this, and then we can rerun this to see. Great. So a couple of things to mention is that if we have two things, an accept and a reject, and the resolve fires before the reject, the reject will never uh, fire here. 
So we'll just exit the promise. So I'll go ahead and I'll clear this. So here, we'll change the resolve to read no error, everything, everything great. Um, and so we expect here, because this resolve function is going to fire first, that we'll get in consumer, no error, everything is great. So in consumer, no error, everything is great. Excellent. But if this did not fire first, and instead the reject fired, we would get in consumer, here is an error. We can have multiple resolves and rejects. So for example, if we had just resolve, stop now, we would get in consumer, stop now. So in consumer, stop now. Notice none of these other things fired. So uh, next time, uh, we're going to take a look at um, writing the web request example using this producer consumer model or promise consumer model. Great. Uh, so in this lecture, we're going to talk about um, the promise all syntax. And then we'll uh, start looking at arrays where we'll talk about some functions that will help you write cleaner JavaScript code, uh, namely map, reduce, and filter. Okay, so let's dig in. So what is this promise all syntax? So the promise.all method returns a single promise that resolves when all the promises uh, passed as an iterable, so this could be an array, have resolved, or when the iterable contains no promises. This uh, promise will also reject if any of the promises um, in that array reject for some reason. And in particular, it will take the first uh, promise that rejects. So just to say that simply, it rejects with the reason of the first promise that rejects. So it looks through the array, finds the first one that rejects, and then fires a reject for that promise. Okay, so let's switch over to some live coding. Okay, so let's look at a live coding example of uh, using this new promise all syntax. So let's create uh, three promises and we'll make them globally available. So promise.resolve and we'll just make this first one resolve by three. Then we'll make something that just has a value that returns immediately. So just one, three, three, seven. And then we'll make a third promise that will actually resolve. Well, let's do Let's do this. So we'll make a third promise that resolves uh, after some time. So we'll pass in an error function with resolve and reject. And then we'll have our set timeout happen. And we'll call resolve with and maybe we'll do single quotes here. Um, and we'll have that fire after 100 milliseconds. So then we can say promise.all, and we can pass in a collection. In this case, we'll do an array of all of our promises. And notice it's a mixed type because we have a number type in here. And then this dot then will fire when all the promises have resolved, and the values will contain a collection, in this case an array, with the result. So values, and then we'll make this an error function. And then I'll just go ahead and console.log uh, values. So this should print out 3, 1, 3, 3, 7, and 100. So let's go ahead and run this. That would be fun. Made a mistake here with my spelling. Should have been values, not value. So clear this, and I'll save it, and then we'll run this again. Great. Three, one, three, seven, and foo. 
Okay, so I'll save this and uh, we'll uh, switch over now to slides and talk a little bit about arrays in JavaScript. So uh, arrays in JavaScript are a little special. Um, and in particular, the uh, root object um, for arrays supports a couple of cool things. Um, it supports these methods, map, reduce, and filter. And they're particularly useful when filtering through data or trying to um, structure data in a way that it makes it easy to present. And they're particularly interesting when used with arrow functions. So let's switch back over to a live coding session and we'll look through some examples of where uh, these map, reduce, and filter functions actually help us to write cleaner, more readable code. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, create a new array. I'll close this explorer to give us some more screen space. So let's create an array called students. And this array, we create it with this bracket syntax, can contain anything, because JavaScript is dynamically typed. So we'll make this array contain a collection of objects. So the first student object has a grade. Uh, the student had 93. Name, uh, Deshae. Oops. And then another object. Um, maybe we'll do this on multiple lines for readability. And then the student had a grade of 96. And a name, Devin. And then a final student with grade of 90 and name of Alicia. Okay. And so that's our uh, student array. And so say we wanted to go ahead and get all of the grades create a new array that had all of the grades for each of these students. So one approach might be we initialize some array for the grades. And um, this grades array, we'll go through and we'll say, um, start off with some i starting at zero, little for loop, i less than the student's dot length, right, i plus plus. So it's going to go through all of our students. And then we would get our grade. So we do grades.push. And then we do students at index i and get the grade value. So this might be one way. And I'll just console log the grades here so we can see this. And we'll run this. So this is one way of kind of getting all of the grades um, from our array. And so here is our grades. But there is a different approach. Um, approach that allows for a lot of parallelism and also in some ways uh, some more readability. So let's switch back over to the slides and we'll talk about this concept called map. And then we'll use that map concept to get the grades from our new student uh, array. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this new concept of map. So what JavaScript allows is for you to apply an individual function, shown in this box here, to every single element in the array in parallel. So I can apply this function to every single element in the array completely in parallel. And then I'll get a new array with the result of that function applied to each of those independent elements here. So say we had something that would square a particular value. So here's my arrow function, it takes in some value x, and then it returns x times x. So if I apply that function, if I map that function to this array, it will multiply each of these numbers by itself and store that result in a new array. So one times one is just one, two times two will be four, three times three will be nine, and then four times four will be 16. And so here will be the result of completing that map. 
So let's look at an example of where we're going to use the math function to extract the grades from that student rate. So let's switch back over to a live coding session. Okay, so here we have our student array. And instead of doing this for loop to generate this grades array, we're going to use the map function. So first we need to create a function that's going to get us all of our grades. So we need something that will take in an individual uh, object and extract the grades. So let's call this map function. And it's going to it's going to be a function that takes in a student object and simply returns the grade. Student grade. And now we can create a new grades array by saying student dot map the map function. So it's going to take that function and apply it to every single student. And we need to make sure we spell student correctly. Every single student, and then return a new array with the result of that function. So in this case, it's student.grade. And so now we go ahead and we clear this. And then we do node array fun. Yes. Um, we get a reference error because it should be students with a capital S. So fix that. Um, great, we get 939690, which is what we expected. So we can also make this more compressed, right? So we could create a function here as it's being passed in. And you'll often see this done. And so this is still valid. So we'll clear this and we'll run this again. And we get the results as expected. And sometimes you'll see an arrow function used. So it's common to use arrow functions with this map syntax. And because it's only returning one line, we just need a one line arrow function here. And so we'll add some space between the arrow and the function body. And you'll see something that looks like this. So let's clear, and then we'll run this one more time and we get the same result. So this is just a nice clean way of um, extracting the grade from every student in the array. And you can look at this and you can read that this is going to create a new array with the student.grade parameters. And if we wanted to scale those grades, say multiply it by 1.1 to give everybody a 1% bump, we could do it that way. And so. There we go, here's our grades with the 1% bump. Okay, so let's look at another uh, function that's available to us called filter. So let's switch back to the slides and look at this filter function. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the filter function. So here's our old array, and what the filter function will do is it will take in a function, and this function is required to return either true or false. And then that filter function is applied in parallel to the array. And if uh, the result of that filter function is false, that value is not included in the new array. So notice here that this one value is not included in this new array. And the same thing for this two value, it's also not included in and that's because our filter function here is x greater than 2. So um, 1 isn't greater than 2, 2 isn't greater than 2, but 3 is. So its result is included in the array. And all of these are kind of applied in parallel. And so this is a great way if you want to kind of uh, extract some data from your uh, JSON uh, the filter function is an amazing uh, tool. So let's see this filter function in action.
Great. So uh, now let's look at some examples of using the filter function. So in this example, we want to identify students who have a grade of 91 or greater. So that would include Deshay and Devin, and not include uh, Felicia. So how might we use the uh, filter method to do this? Well, first let's create a filter function. So filter 91 or above. And this filter function is going to take in a student. And then it's going to look at their grade. So students dot grade. And if the grade is greater than or equal to 91, then we're going to keep them. So uh, we do that by returning true. Otherwise, we're going to return false. Great. So now that we have our filter function, we can go ahead and filter the students using it. So we can create a new array called top students. And we can call students.filter and pass in our filter above function. And so now this will create an array of all of our top students, and that array should contain Deshay and Devin. And so if we go ahead and uh, log this top students array, it's going to contain these top two objects. So. Great, uh, we get uh, that result as expected. So now let's uh, switch over to the slides and we'll talk about the reduce function um, and how it's also a very, very useful function in JavaScript. Okay, so let's switch back over to the slides. So another function that's kind of straightforward is this reduction function. And the reduce function um, is unique in that it actually outputs a single value. And so the kind of key idea here with, uh, with reduce is that it's going to take in two parameters and apply that function. And it's going to pass the result again to that same function with uh, the next value in the array. And then it will take that result, pass it to that function with the next value in that array. And it will reduce it all the way down to a single value. So a couple key things here. It takes two parameters. And the, the result is stored in the, per in the first parameter, so here. That's where the result is going to be stored. So let's look at a kind of practical example of this. So say this function was some function called sum. So it would take two parameters, d and 1, and it would compute d plus 1. And then the result would update sum to be d plus 1. So the next time it would be 2 plus sum, which happened to be d plus 1. Then it would produce d plus 1 plus 2. And that would be the sum variable that pops out here. And then we would do d plus 1 plus 2, which was the sum from the previous one, plus 3 to get our final result, which is the single value, which is the sum of all of these. And the default value is the value that must be passed into the reduce function. So here, it would start off with 0, and then you would get uh, 6 as your sum. So let's look at a reduce example. And actually, let's uh, switch over to the live coding environment. OK, so uh, let's uh, look at uh, a reduce example. And in particular, let's go ahead and generate that grades array again. And then we're going to reduce that grades array and calculate the average. So we generate the grades array by going to our students and then mapping. And our hour function, we're going to take student. And we're going to need an hour function of student.grade. Um, and so this gets us all our grades. And then we could do a reduction on our grades, so our sum is going to be, well first let's write our reducer function. So our reducer function is going to be a function we're going to call it reducer. We have a function, and it's going to take in two uh, values. It's going to take in our sum, so our first parameter, this is going to be the one we accumulate, and then the current grade that we're considering. And then it's simply going to return sum plus plus equals the grade. 
Wait. And so that's our reducer. And then we can call on our grades to get the sum. We can get grades and dot reduce. And we can pass in our reducer and our default value of zero. And then we can go ahead and console log the sum. So if we go and run this, we get our correct sum. And then we can just go ahead and divide that sum by the number of things in the array. So dot students dot length. And final quiz, uh, node. And now our new sum is actually our average. Average. So refund that to us. Average is a 93. So uh, let's go ahead now and make this a single line arrow function. So we're going to have our first parameter. Um, and then grades, and then we're just going to do sum plus equal grade. Mood array on Oops, and we have a small error here. So I added bracket, fix that. So there, and then we'll run it again. And yep, we get our average as expected. So uh, pause the video and think about how you might um, write a mapping function that would give you the student with the highest grade. Okay, so let's go ahead and write for a reducer. So we want a reducer that's going to give us a student with the highest grade. So it can be a function, and we're going to take in some our current high score and our score and our current student. <laughs> and then we're gonna see if the high score dot grade is larger than the score if yes. If the high score is grade is larger than the current student's grade, then we're gonna return high scorer. Otherwise, the student, otherwise we're going to return the student's grade. Otherwise, we're going to return the current student, sorry. So that's going to be our new high score. So we're going to return student. Um, so there's our reducer. So now we can go and pass our default of zero, and we'll run our reducer. And we'll throw this, and so we expect that our high score here is gonna be mark. So instead of average, we're not gonna divide by the student length, right? We're just gonna call our reducer, and it's not gonna be on grades. We're gonna do it on student, because that's the student array that we wanna reduce. And then our result's gonna be our high score. And then we can go ahead and run this so node raise fun. And we get an error that says student is not defined. So it's because we need to do it on the students array. So we'll clear this. And we'll do node array fun. So here we're getting the lowest score. So there's a small error. So if the high score's grade was greater than the student's grade, then we would return the high scorer. Otherwise, we'd return the student. So pause the video and see if you can think about what's the error here. So uh, here, we're processing the student's uh, array, and it's an object. So dot grade is not a property of that object. So this is going to come back as undefined. What we need to do is we need to be looking at this student value. And so here, if we make this adjustment and we rerun it, 
we get our high scoring student.